The Seahawks are coming off of a massive win in Atlanta against the Falcons as the Seahawks defense dominated this game, forced Kirk Cousins to turn over the ball three times, en route to a 34-14 win, moving the Seahawks to above 500 once again this season. It's to be determined if DK Metcalf will be back in time for this game against the Bills, but also some big news this week was that the Seahawks traded Jerome Baker in a fourth round draft pick to the Tennessee Titans in exchange for linebacker Ernest Jones IV. Offensive tackles Abraham Lucas and George Fant also returned to practice. They placed tackle Stone Forsyth on the injured list, and they also claimed linebacker Josh Ross off the waivers from Baltimore. It's going to be a tough matchup with the elite Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills coming into town, so let's get into the Hawks-Bills preview with Will Ordner. But before we do, the sponsor of this podcast is Black Label Supplements. Make sure to check them out. This week and this week alone, they are having a clearance sale. Select products are going to be 50% off. Visit blacklabelsupplements.com and give them a try. And as always, if you or someone you know is thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing a property in the Pacific Northwest, reach out to myself, Connor Webb, the Couch GM, as I'm a full-time mortgage broker during the day, and it's my goal to help as many sports fans and athletes get into the home of their dreams. My contact information will be in the description of this video if you'd like to reach out and connect. And with that, let's get into the episode. Seattle Seahawks coming off of a big win in Atlanta this week, 34 to 14. The Falcons were pretty red hot. The Hawks were pretty ice cold and they were able to take down the Falcons, a big defensive game for the Seahawks. The Falcons turned it over three times. We saw Michael Penix's debut for the Falcons. Overall, a solid game for the Seahawks. The underdogs were able to take the game. What do you think of, of, of this uh, week's matchup? I thought Seattle did a good job of getting the running game started. I mean, look, they only had 103 yards. They're not going to be a team that runs the football 40 times a game. That just isn't what's going to happen. But if you can get 14 carries to Kenneth Walker, basically 70 yards, 69, nice, and a touchdown, like that's a pretty good performance on that ground game. I really like the uh, the kid out of Finley. The D2 product coming in, your fourth right tackle you've had this year. Kid absolutely played fantastic. I mean, he had some issues at times, but it wasn't anything worse than what you saw from Stone Forsyth. Now, it's also the perfect opportunity to get him some reps because you're playing an Atlanta team that isn't known for getting after the passer. Like, they don't have a premier uh, pass rush candidate, right? Uh, if they're getting sacks, it's because they're dialing up fire zones and blitzes and man blitzes, and it's just, it's just it's a good team to get started with in that uh avenue thought he played absolutely fantastic thought dk had another big game he had seven targets only ended up having four receptions 99 yards a touchdown a little bit worried about the mcl sprain wouldn't hate to see him sit out a week or two but i also know with the way that he's been cooking this season it feels like it's about to be a career year for him so it wouldn't shock me if he tried to get back in but i think that's just going to unlock more jsn dk is going to beat double coverage in a different way than most wide receivers, just because he's so much stronger and more physical than everyone. Where like JSN is more like Tyler Lockett. He's going to have to be smart. He's going to have to run crisper routes. But I also think if DK has to sit out for a week or two, that's the perfect time for JSN to explode. Also love what Noah Fan's been doing in the passing game. It feels like this is the first year where he's really getting used to his full potential. And he seems to be living up to it right now. Four catches, 65 yards, like that's not going to knock your hair back. But when you get targeted four times and you make four catches, that's huge. And it always felt like it was on a second and long or a third and medium where it's like you need to get the first down or you need to get close to the first down so that they can make the decision to go for it or every single play in your playbook is open on third down. And that's where Noah Fant came in and he was big. So overall, I just I liked how the game went. Gino looked good. Obviously, was kept upright aside from the one sack. He only threw the ball 28 times in this game. I like that number a little bit more. Obviously, Gino is going to throw more. That's what Grubb is here to do. But you don't need him dropping back 50 times. That's a problem. That means you're losing, and you're losing pretty badly. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, JSN in the receiving game. We got to talk about him in the passing game also. He had one completion yeah. for 35 yards, a bomb to DK Metcalf. And yeah, as you mentioned also, Geno Smith, one of his lowest production games on the year, 18 for 28, just 207 yards in the air. And then Kenneth Walker, he he looked solid, uh, 14 carries, 69 yards, an average of nearly five. And it, yeah, he was put on the injury report in the days before the game, but he ended up you know, having a solid flu game. The, the defense was really able to limit what the Falcons were able to do. I mean, Bijan Robinson, he was explosive as per usual this year 21 carries 103 yards an average of right at five which is what 4.9 which is what kenneth walker the third average but they they turned it over three separate times kirk cousins all three times 
that fumble in the third quarter really helped secure the win for the Seahawks. Boy, Mafe was able to hit Kirk Cousins as he was trying to throw it. Derek Hall was able to scoop it up and score. And that was really the end of it. Then a couple errant throws by, you know, Kirk Cousins later on in the game, Kobe Bryant and Julian Love both got interceptions there. So all overall, a solid showing from the defense that was showing a lot of issues uh, up until this point in the season. Got healthy. That defense got really, really healthy. And this is what the difference with this team is, is when you have Byron Murphy in there and when you don't. Like, he misses two or three games. You struggled for two or three games. Now, that is worrisome to me to a degree that that one player can make that much of a difference. But that's why you went out and you signed him, right? That's why you drafted him. That's why you did all the scouting and you made sure you went up and you got him. I also felt like Boye Mafe is finally back to being 100% healthy. Like he's fighting through things. He's a warrior. He's not going to sit out. But sometimes it takes two to three weeks, even though you're good enough to play before you're back to 100%. And now you're seeing him get back after the passer like he was in the first two weeks, right? And that Atlanta Falcons, they're not the best offensive line in the NFL, but they're a pretty good one. They're an average NFL offensive line. And I felt like you were able to get Boye Mafe in a lot of one-on-ones because now you have to worry about Murphy in the middle. Now Williams, he's being able to do more because he's not getting double teamed as much. That rate gets down lower. I thought Roy Robertson Harris, Came in and had a fantastic game, five tackles from his spot. You know, I came in here and I was like, well, you know, he's an average guy with depth. If you're going to go out and get five tackles at that spot, you're not an average with depth guy. You're another real good rotation guy. I was very impressed with how the D-line played in this one. And when you can get the D-line playing in the other team's backfield, good things are always going to happen. Draymond Jones had a fantastic game, multiple TFLs. I just felt like they were building on stuff, and you really saw, hey, this is what this defense is when they're 100% healthy. Are you going to be able to keep them 100% healthy throughout the rest of the year? I don't know. It's the NFL. It's a war of attrition. It worries me a little bit that one or two players not being at 100% can completely change what your defense is. But let's make no bones about it. This Atlanta team, at worst, is a just outside of the playoffs team. There's a decent chance that they win that NFC South, and they're the number four seed going into the playoffs. And if they don't, they're going to be right there in the wild card hunt. And you just went into their house, and you smacked them, and you embarrassed them, right? So I feel like if you're a Seahawks fan, you can kind of pump the brakes. You can relax. You know, you're going to be okay. You went three and three at the beginning of the year. You expected to be three and three in that spot. You just expected to have one different loss and one different win. And I think because they got flipped and they were three in a row, everyone freaked out. Now you're about to go take on a Buffalo team. That is really good. I wouldn't be shocked if you are four and four. In fact, I kind of expect you to be four and four. Doesn't mean all of a sudden the sky is falling again. Stay the course. You're going to go through the toughest stretch of your season for the next four to six weeks or so, and then it gets easier again. And it gets easier right as you're getting close to playoff time, and you might be able to find your way into the playoff hunt just because of what your schedule is and what this team can be if 100% healthy. Yeah, and just like that, the Seahawks are now 4-3. and three. They're leading the division again. You know, the Arizona yeah. Cardinals are 3-4. and four. The 49ers are 3-4. and four. The Rams are 2-4. and four. They're banged up. The Seahawks, you know, were able to get a a big win in in Atlanta. As you mentioned, the Bills are coming into town. They are currently leading the AFC East. They're five and two. They are second in all of football right now in total point differential. They are plus 63 on the year. This is going to be a tough matchup. They recently acquired Amari Cooper. Last this last week was his first game with the Bills. They have a, a potent offense with Josh Allen. What do you expect in this matchup? With the Bills. Look, you're going to have to find a way to uh, speed up Josh Allen's process. You got to get crazy Josh Allen to come back. This year so far, Josh Allen, he hasn't thrown any interceptions. If I'm still on the correct year, he's been clean there. What that means is Josh Allen has done a better job of when something isn't there, he throws the ball away or he just runs himself. I also think that this Buffalo Bills team has done a good job of establishing the running game with Cook. So that's kind of given Allen more windows to throw through. Aside from the Texans game, he's been very, very good. Now, where Josh Allen is at his best, he's also at his worst. And that's what we call chaotic Josh Allen. 
And that's where he looks like he's almost just mashing all the buttons when like you don't know how to play a Madden game. So you just start hitting everything possible. And then all of a sudden you'll be in a breakaway touchdown run and you're pitching it back five yards. And all of a sudden your offensive lineman has it. Josh Allen, as he's gotten older, has been able to get rid of chaotic Josh Allen, but chaotic Josh Allen is still in there and he pops his head out every once in a while. You have to find a way to get him dialed up. And I don't know if that's by bringing more blitzes. I don't know if that's by stopping the run game and making them one dimensional so that they have to pass, but you have to find a way to speed up his process because he seems to have an ability when his process is sped up and when he's not at peak Josh Allen to make big mistakes. And this defense has shown when you can get him and get other quarterbacks to make big mistakes, they're going to take advantage of that. Now, the other problem, right? Offensively, you had been healthy the entire time. Now you're banged up and you're going up against a pretty decent Buffalo Bills defense. So again, I think you have to find a way to get the ground game going. Kenneth Walker, look, he's not going to get 20 carries. But if you can get him to that 15 to 18 mark, that means that this is a close game or you're winning. That's good. And then get the ball out of Geno Smith's hands early so they're not able to dial up their crazy blitzes, fire zones that they want to do. Get the ball out of Geno Smith's hands. And look, if DK is not able to go, that's okay. Get the ball into Lockett's hands. Get the ball into JSN's hands, and then find different ways to get the ball into Barner or Fant's hands. I think that those two tight ends, they're big, they're strong, and they're fast when they get going. They're not afraid to block for others too. So reward them for their good blocking. Find a way to get the ball into their hands. And then I totally forgot about this with all the crazy trades that have been going down today, but Amari Cooper's there now. Look, it's obvious on his touchdown pass, he has no idea what he's doing. You can look, Keon Coleman's like, dude, just post. (laughs) <laughs> Keon Coleman is telling him what to do but guess what he's got another week in the system will he know it 100 no but there's going to be some important things now that he knows that he didn't know last week so you're going to have to find a way to stop him uh looks like Woolen is starting to get back a little bit into limited practice fingers crossed that you get him back and then you can go Witherspoon and Woolen matched up on their best two wide receivers in Coleman and Cooper yeah as you mentioned Josh Allen on the year, 63 completion percentage, four, just shy of 1,500 yards so far. 12 touchdowns, no interceptions. He's been perfect on the year so far, averaging 7.8 good. per pass. And then also via PFF, looking at you know this matchup, I mean, it ranks the Seahawks passing offense at 6. It, it has the Buffalo Bills at 18. But then as far as run offense, it has the Bills at 5 overall for rushing. It has the Seahawks at rank, ranked 4 overall for rushing for grades. So... Again, PFF isn't the end all be all, but it seems like, you know, Buffalo's rushing game is also something that you need to look out for. Of course, they have James Cook. He, he's been doing great so far this year. Let me look up his stats. Uh, he's got like 300 yards or so. He's on 80 something carries, five or six. I think he's got five TDs. I think he's one shy of Walker. He's a more physical runner. And those types of runners are where Seattle has had issues with. And that's a big, big offensive line. I mean, your right tackle, Spencer Brown, that cat's like 6'8". Deion Dawkins is a big, mean dude over on the left side. They are big and they are physical in Buffalo because they have to be. You have to build a big physical team out there because in December and January, it's going to be snowy everywhere. You can't have weak guys, even on the O-line. Like Sometimes on the O-line, it's like, well, he's 6'5", 300 pounds, must be big. That's not how it works in Buffalo because you got to deal with the elements. You got to deal with the weather. So that's a big physical group. It's really going to test this Seattle D-line. Are you fully healthy? And what do you look like going up against one of the better units in football? They also have two tight ends in Kincaid and in Knox that are great run blockers, old school. But then when they get in the passing game, they can move like a Travis Kelsey. They can move like a Noah Fant, like an A.J. Barner, Mm -hmm. better than an A.J. Barner. No offense to A.J. Barner. He's just not there yet. Maybe one day he will be. I hope he will. But – you start looking at that team and they're built to win games in Buffalo when it's cold, when it's wet, when it's snowy, when it's hard to throw, when it's hard to run, to cut, to juke. So when you play them in games where it's 50 degrees, clear skies, no snow, no precipitation, those attributes come up to the oomph degree. So you have to find your own ways to beat them. Well, you might have to use your speed and your quickness 
to beat their overall size and strength. Currently, the uh, the Bills are favored by three points in Seattle. The over under is forty six and a half. What do you think of those lines? Three seems a little low for Buffalo. Just being honest with you, like I think that the Seahawks are a frisky, fun team. I think at the end of the year, Seattle is going to be right about that playoff spot. If they make the playoffs, won't be surprised. If they just miss out on the playoffs, won't be surprised. They'd either have to be like, we locked up, you know, Seattle Seahawks, they've locked up the division week 14 to surprise me, or they're out of it. Week 14, Seattle mathematically eliminated, right? Those are the only things that surprise me. You should basically be in it till about week 16, week 17. That's what I think out of Seattle. But I think you're lying to yourself if you think this is a Super Bowl team right now as constructed where everyone's at. You're a good team. You're probably a playoff team. You might win a game. You probably don't win two in the playoffs. Look at Buffalo. They're in a Super Bowl win now window. And everyone thought they kind of got out of it because they got rid of Diggs. They got rid of... uh You know, guys like Poyer, they didn't get rid of Milano, but Milano's banged up. He's not playing this year. They got rid of Hyde, right, on the defensive side. They got rid of Gabe Davis on the offensive side. So you look at them and you're like, oh, they're resetting, they're reloading. And then with the way that Josh Allen has played and the way that offense has looked and the defense too, it's like, no, that's still a Super Bowl or bust kind of team. Like you feel like you're in a spot there where depending on how the playoff bracket breaks out and where you end up dude you better be competing for that super bowl title i think if you don't make it out of the divisional round unless you lose to kansas city there's going to be some legit anger coming out of buffalo there might be some seats getting hot for your head coach over there right that's just where they're at in the position that they put themselves in because of how well they've played the last few years and because of how well that roster is constructed as of right now and honestly you have the second or fifth best quarterback in the league, he's somewhere in that range, right? Whoever you talk to, they're going to rank Josh Allen. No one's ranking him past fifth or sixth. That's how good he is. You can win a Super Bowl with a quarterback that is that good because he can mask some of your other deficiencies. So to me, when I look at this game, there aren't that many significant injuries on the Buffalo side. Seahawks side, you're banged up. That number to me should be more than three on the road yeah i mean we didn't expect the seahawks to go into atlanta to do what they did against them you know the the falcons were hot the the bills they they look like on paper that it should be kind of the same as what you you would have expected last week against the falcons so we'll see if the seahawks can pull something off and also it was announced today that the seahawks and the titans made a trade they did a linebacker swap seattle sent linebacker jerome baker and a fourth round pick to the tennessee titans in exchange for linebacker ernest jones the fourth What do you know about Ernest Jones, the fourth and what he might bring to this team? He's a younger player, about the same size as Baker. Baker's a little bit older. So you're going to get, there's a little bit more room for upside because you believe that there is a possibility of a little more growth. Jones right now on the season, he's got 25 solo tackles, which isn't bad. He's been playing pretty well. Um, He's got 44 total tackles. So that projects him out. Somewhere between 125 and 130 when it comes to his total tackles, which at a linebacker spot isn't like, oh my God, Bobby Wagner 2.0. But it's also not like, "Ah, this guy's a bum. Why do we trade for him, right? Like there's a reason why you had to give up some draft capital as well. I don't hate the trade. I feel like Mike McDonald has proven that he can identify talent and he can put that talent into his system and that player can take a gigantic step up compared to what they might have been in a previous system right like Hamilton in Baltimore was good then McDonald comes in and he's great the one that stands out to me the most is his three tech Matabike Matabike is an average three tech everywhere he goes good NFL player not great he gets to Baltimore He's the second best three tech in the league behind Chris Jones. What he was doing last year was unbelievable and it got him paid. He made big time run stops and he also got after the quarterback in a position where few players can do both. Most can stop the run. Few can get after the passer and the ones that can do both get paid. So 
McDonald has a track record of being able to identify this type of talent. And so hopefully he has done that here with Ernest Jones, the fourth. I like the pick. He's a big physical cat. Feels like a guy that can play in a bunch of different spots. Um, so I like the move there. Let him play next to Dodson. If he needs to move out in certain packages, he can move out. He's a decent cover guy. So I like to see what will happen. I don't think he'll get much play in CenturyLink when they take on Buffalo, but you never know. They might have certain packages where maybe they can sneak him in. When you make a trade like this on a Wednesday, dude's maybe getting out there Thursday, maybe practicing. You're probably not going to get him into the system until next week. And even then, you're probably still only getting him in in certain packages. Kind of the same thing that I talked about with Amari Cooper. It makes me kind of question how they are able to, you know, identify the players that would fit well within their system. And that makes sense. And, and how much of a role McDonald has in that process of finding and making the final decision on, hey, this guy would fit the system. Let's go get him. Or if that's, you know, on the GM mainly to, to do that. Uh, wh what are your thoughts on how that? When you look at a guy like Ernest Jones, the fourth, right? This is going to be a little bit of both. Because he's been in L.A. the last three years. L.A. traded him away. Rams, not Chargers. So he's been with the Rams the last three years. Every single year, first year, kind of starts out more as a special teams guy. Certain packages he comes in. Next year, now he's playing in all 17 games. He's got 114 tackles. You're seeing him as more of an every-down linebacker. 2023, now he's an every-down linebacker. He's playing every snap. He's got 145 tackles. He's got four and a half sacks. You know, he's got a couple of pass defenses. He has an interception on his on his thing. So as the seasons have gone on, it's clear that he's grown more into the role of being a starter. He now gets traded over to Tennessee. He's doing all right, but doesn't sound like he kind of fits with what Tennessee wants. He might fit with what Seattle has. So what probably happened here is some combination of either Schneider at the GM spot going, hey, man, this guy's on the block, or what's a position of need that you would like to fill? McDonald will either go, that guy that's on the block, I think he can fit in my system in this way, or he goes, hey, right now, we feel like we can improve in that linebacker spot. And then they sit down and they work together, watching through film, trade, you know, talking to teams, who's available to trade, who's here for this, what do you want for this person, what do you want for that person? And then you go and you find the best possible player that fits your scheme that also his asking price makes sense, right? Essentially, you're looking at this as it's a straight-up trade, linebacker for linebacker, and then you're giving up a sixth-rounder, which is a guy that you kind of take a flyer on anyways. Like how many sixth-rounders come in day one, they're the number one starter in any position, aside from kicker? Almost never happens, right? That's a guy that can be a starter, and sometimes they become great starters, <laughs> Tom Brady, but it <laughs> takes time, right? They have to build. They have to have that year where they're a special teams guy or two, and then they're in certain packages, and then they're the, it, it takes time. It's so rare now. Like back in the 80s, you didn't watch every football game, so you're trusting scouts. So sometimes scouts miss certain things, and a guy like Joe Montana can be a late-round draft pick. Nowadays, dude, every single game is watched. Every single game is T-Vote. you got scouts everywhere. You've got people who are mercenaries, you know, that you'll just pay and say, hey, man, what, you live in this area, you've watched a bunch of games for these people. What's going on here? What's going on there? You know, shoot, if you really want to, you just got to get ESPN+. Plus. You can watch 90% of college football that you want, and you can start making your own claims and open up your own website and be like, I am pro football will, and look at what I believe. Right. And I saw so you won your fantasy league last year. What are your thoughts on? Yeah, exactly. Like, exactly. Like, anybody can now be not a pro scout, but anyone can claim that they're a scout. Right. And so anyone can be a couch GM. No, <laughs> only you. <laughs> but you know what I mean in that sense of like, if you really want to and you have the drive, you can do these things at home. So guys don't fall through the cracks. Now it's about a coach identifying strengths that that player has that fits into their system. Because a guy like Ernest Jones IV, he might fit perfectly into McDonald's system. He might want more of a bigger linebacker who's a bruiser, and now he can flourish. 
But when you go look at like a Spagnola defense where he wants speed, he wants smaller guys, quicker guys flying around. Now he wants the big interior D lineman, but on the defensive end side, they're a little undersized height wise, but weight wise, they're strong and they're fast like a Karloftis. And then they're making big plays. Ernest Jones, the fourth might not fit into that because he's a little bit bigger at that linebacker spot where they might ask you to cover more at that linebacker spot because of the different blitzes they're dialing up. So you just kind of have to understand as a head coach or a defensive coordinator, you're going to identify players that'll fit your scheme. You might come up with a list of five to 10 that you think could be on the block. You go to your GM, your GM calls around and sees if it works or other teams will call you and your GM will look at it and go, Hey, well, we're kind of weak on the linebacker spot. This is Ernest Jones, the fourth guy. I think he kind of fits with McDonald's system. We've talked about it before. He'll go down and talk to Mike. Mike will figure it out. So I think I've, I took a really long time to answer a very simple thing of it kind of works in both ways. Sometimes it's the GM. Sometimes it's the head coach more than likely it's both of them working together saying we need to find this position Let's look. Hey, here are the candidates that have come back. Okay, these are the ones that will fit my scheme defensively. Okay, who can give me the best deal? Here are the deals. Which one do you like the best and which one am I comfortable giving up future capital for? I I wish more teams would do behind the scenes, you know, documentaries, vlogs, kind of like hard knocks to to show what the process looks like exactly, you know, when scouting, when looking at players to trade for, clearly the Titans are reloading a little bit. They also traded DeAndre Hopkins to the Chiefs, and the uh, the NFL trade deadline is November fifth this year. We're about two and a half weeks from the trade deadline right now. Since the beginning of the season, we've been talking about how the linebacker spot is one of the weakest spots on this on this roster. So we'll see if this move can help bolster that. What other positions do you think, or what other moves do you think? the Seahawks might be looking to to make? I know that's a tough question. The problem with Seattle is, at least when it comes to the trading, is the injuries that you've had, they're not season enders. Like, if I'm in Tampa Bay right now, would I be shocked if Tampa Bay went out and made a trade for a wide receiver? No. You just had your top two, I mean, your second guy. Yeah, oh my gosh. (laughs) Godwin, like his season's done. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I've never dislocated an ankle. That didn't look fun. When your foot is facing the wrong way, 180, not cool, dude, not super fun. How does that affect your career long-term, right? You know, and Evan's like, he's dealing with a hamstring. Hamstrings linger. They take a while. So, yeah, they're like, hopefully we get him back week 11. Is that really going to be full percent? Like, is that him at 100? How many times have we seen a guy get a hamstring strain and it's like, oh, well, he'll only be out two weeks. And then all of a sudden it's like, man, that guy didn't play the rest of the year. What happened? Kept getting, you know, set back. Those are ones that stick forever. And right now Seattle doesn't really have a a room where that injury, like positioning is that bad. I mean, I think the easy answer is always going to be the offensive line just because, I mean, what, you're on your fourth starting right tackle right now? You know, you're hoping you're going to, but, but again, you're hoping you're going to get Lucas back. Like he was back and again, limited practice, but he practiced this week, you know, and the Finley kid looks like that. He's starting to, you know, he shows some signs of being pretty decent. So the more that you go through it, it's just, I don't really see a huge position of like fear. You had a bunch of D line injuries. So you made a trade your linebacker position. It's been kind of weak. You made a trade. Mm-hmm. Everywhere else, it's like, yeah, you're missing Reek Woolen. He's supposed to be back soon. Kenneth Walker's been dealing in with injury and illness. Well, I mean, how long is a cold going to keep you out? You know, DK Metcalf, MCL sprain. Well, you still have Tyler Lockett and you have JSN. And DK, you got Bobo. Like he, and Bobo, you know, and DK's one of the biggest freaks out there. Like, would it shock me if he played this week and had 100 yards? No, it wouldn't, you know? It also wouldn't shock me for him to sit up. You got Chenault, too. Chenault's nothing to shake his stick at. So you start going through, like, the list and the positions, and it's, you just don't really have a position where it's glaringly weak, I would say, that doesn't have a light at the end of the tunnel, you would think, right? Like, offensive line-wise you feel like Lucas is coming back soon. So you might not want to make a big move there. I would be a little bit surprised, but 
to be honest, I was also a little bit surprised that they were able to pull the trigger on Jones the fourth. Like, how often did Pete Carroll have issues like that? And he was just like, never, not doing it. And so I guess even we have to adjust to the McDonald era of, hey, if people aren't performing, he's not afraid to go and trade for someone new. Yeah, we're all enjoying the McDonald experience so far. It's different. It's uh, it's a different look, but it's angrier, angrier, maybe angrier, intense. He is much more intense. And I'm, and that's not a knock on him. And that's not a knock on Pete. There are many different ways to coach a football team. Pete was a player's coach through and through. McDonald is not that. Now, he's not Bobby Knight. He's not throwing chairs at players. He's not threatening players to fights. He's not taking his shirt off in a meeting and like, fight me now. Like, he's not doing that. But when guys don't do what they're supposed to do, they're held accountable to a level more so than what it sounds like Pete was doing. Not that Pete wasn't holding people accountable. He just ran it more player led. Michael, get in your face. They had dudes that did not pass the conditioning test. And he's like, if I could cut you, I would do it now. Like that, that's a boss where it's like, it's a little less friendly. There's a little bit more of a pucker factor, but sometimes people play better under that. Right. And it seems like his players love him and he gets the most out of them. So it might just be, um, it's a different era and we all have to get used to it. We're all, we've all been used to Pete for what, 13, 14 years. He came in in what, 2010, yeah. 2011. You got to get used to uh, the new sheriff in town. He does it a little bit different. It's not a bad thing to have a high standard to hold your team accountable and, and the players, you know, expect big things out of them. So, right. so the game is going to be th- this Sunday, one Oh five start time at Lumen field in Seattle. It is officially fall. It is chilly. The, the the game time start at 105 is going to be 50 degrees up in Seattle. So we're getting to the to the spot to where it's going to start getting cold out there. We're going to start seeing some rain games and, and other stuff. So tune into the game. Make sure to like and subscribe to the Couch GM. Follow Will Ortner on Twitter. And we'll see you on the recap next week.